It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. From the CBS television news staff, Larry LeSeur and Charles Collingwood. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Averill Harriman, formerly ambassador to Russia and secretary of commerce. Mr. Harriman, you've been so active in so many fields of endeavor, I'd just like to single out one of them. Now, right after the end of the big war, you were secretary of commerce. Do you care to tell us how you think the nation's economy looks to you right now? Well, we are certainly uh, starting on a, on a recession. You know, uh, industrial production has uh, dropped off about 5% in the last six months. Car loadings are off uh, 10 or 12% as against last year. And uh, unemployment is creeping up. Uh, and, of course, there's an end to overtime and considerably more part-time un unemployment. Well, do Therefore, we've got to face the fact that we are in a recession at the present time from the peak. Do you agree with uh, President Eisenhower that we can uh, learn to avoid or try to avoid a boom and bust economy, sir? Yes, I certainly do, but I think there's a fundamental difference in the approach of the Democratic Party with that of the administration. It has been consistently since the end of the war the policy of the Democratic Party uh, to keep our economy stable and expanding. There's got to be a normal growth to be healthy, and uh, we, we are increasing our population and increasing our labor force. And that has been successfully done, in spite of certain difficulties of, of inflation and otherwise. But uh, now it seems to me the administration is, is waiting to see what's going to happen. And to talk about uh, shock, uh, shock absorbers uh, for, a, for a recession or a depression. And I think that's the, the wrong way to go about it. We ought to have affirmative policies to keep opportunities for the expansion of business of our, of our country. And I think we can do it if we work together. Well, I recall that right after the war, you counseled that we should expand our economy, although People said we were going to have a depression right then, 48, 49, and we did expand it. Do you think we should go ahead with such a policy now? Yes, we should. And uh, as a matter of fact, in the last five years, we've added, uh, taking in, on the basis of, of this year's prices, $80 billion has been added to our total production in our, in our country. Now, that's more than our entire federal budget, almost double our, our military expenditures. Uh, we can continue to do that, I believe, if we follow the policies which make it possible for, for business to expand and for producers to expand and consumers to, uh, to consume. Well, Mr. Harriman, if we are in a recession now, as one who, as Director for Mutual Security, had a good deal to do with the economics of our allies in Western Europe, what would be the effect of an economic decline in this country on uh, our allies abroad? Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, that disturbs me very much. We can afford, perhaps, to have a little unfortunate situations here and adjust ourselves to it. But uh, take we had a slight recession, you know, in 49 as against 48. It was very slight. And yet our imports dropped very materially from uh, some of the raw material producing countries as, as, as much as 40% over a six-month period. I don't think it's going to be as bad as that, relatively as bad as that, but... Uh, these countries um, are where they are principal markets, you know. Some of these countries have only one product, uh, take Ecuador, cocoa, mm -hmm. and uh, Indonesia, rubber, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Uh, falling off of, of uh, demand from this country creates a, a major economic up upheaval, and with that uh, economic upheaval comes political instability. So that in order to achieve our political objectives of, of uh, stability in the free world, we've got to pay more attention to those people that supply us with the raw materials that we need for our own prosperity and our own life, in fact. Well, isn't the economic state of our friends abroad somewhat better today than it was in 1949? Yes, and therefore I don't think uh, that uh, the effect would be quite as startling as it was in, uh, in 49. But fortunately, we got out of that uh, recession rather rapidly. And I hope we will this one. But you do but, feel uh, that, that we will have, uh, take Europe, uh, mm -hmm. the British are figuring that uh, with the slight recession that... Uh, some of the economists are talking about, it's in prospect, they may lose uh, as much as 25% of their exports to this country, and that will have a, quite a dampening effect on the recovery, which has been going very healthily in England. You mm -hmm. mean that a 5 or 6% drop in our own uh, industrial output 
will be magnified in its magnified. effect on uh, our friends. It will be magnified. Some of, some of the countries think as much as 5%. I mean, uh, five times. In other words, 5% drop might mean 25% drop, but uh, that may be somewhat uh, too fearful, but it can well be three times. Mr. Herman, what would effect would that have on the economies of some of our uh, more powerful allies like Britain? Would that cause them then to devaluate their currency? To no, the I don't think so. Again? I think in 49, it was one of the reasons for devaluation, the fact we stopped buying. But uh, they're in a stronger position now than they were, and um, the prices of raw materials are down more than they were at that time. But uh, it will mean that they will have to uh, perhaps uh, uh, slow up their expansion, which was going along in a healthy way and which helped them maintain their military uh, establishments. You see, Britain has just gotten off rationing, I think you then realize that, after a dozen years, and uh, they may have to go back to rationing again, you know. Well, Mr. Herman... would be a very bad psychological uh, move if they have to do it. I want to ask you a question uh, regarding Russia now. I had many an interview with you in Russia during the war and afterwards when you were ambassador to Moscow. Do you think that anything can be accomplished at this uh, coming meeting of the foreign ministers of the four great powers in Berlin? Well, I'm not much of a prophet, but uh, I'm very glad to see that we are going to have uh, discussions again uh, with, the, with the Russians. Uh, the Malenkov's administration has uh, made certain rather fundamental changes within Russia itself and it's uh, conceivable, I don't say it's probable, but it's, c it's conceivable that he may have something that uh, he wants to talk about. But I wouldn't want to predict, uh, because so far we've seen nothing except uh, gestures, no, nothing but a tactical change, no basic uh, uh, changes which indicate a readiness to settle the world problems. Do you feel that this time there is any possibility of coming to an agreement on some specific item, let's say like Austria? Yes, I think there is a possibility. You know, that's an interesting question, too, because some of the people ask me whether there's any use trying to make agreements with the Russians. Well, I say that there is when uh, the agreements can be specific. Take Austria, you mentioned that. If there is a peace treaty with Austria, why then uh, the Russian troops, the Red Army and the American forces, the British, the French, withdraw simultaneously. Then Austria becomes free, it becomes a fait accompli. And that is an agreement which uh, is real and positive, but we haven't any right to uh, trust uh, the Kremlin to carry out general agreements in good faith as, as we would attempt to do them. Mr. Herman, you had many meetings in the Kremlin uh, with uh, Stalin when he was alive. Do you see any specific changes in Russia following his death? Do you think there's a weakness? Well, there's that? certainly uh, the Kremlin is substantially weakened by Stalin's death. The prestige of Stalin was very great. We've seen it, uh, of course, among the satellites. The most striking case was in East Germany. People uh, rose up. I think within Russia themselves, it's, it's clear that the Kremlin feels that they have to make certain concessions to the people. They're talking about increasing the production of consumer goods and food, and that will, that's an indication that the, there's restlessness within the Soviet Union. They may well be able to control it, however. Mr. Harriman, uh, you're the, uh, probably the most distinguished uh, uh, spokesman for foreign policy of the party which is now out of power. What do you, as uh, an official of the former administration, think of the conduct of foreign policy of the present administration? Well, uh, they are attempting to carry on the policies that our government has been following for the, for the last several years. Uh, and um, in many ways, they are, are carrying them out. Their objectives are, are the same, and their objectives are good. I am somewhat fearful by several things. One is the dictatorial attitude that uh, is, is taken on, on, on occasions. I don't think that's the way to deal with our friends and allies. Leadership means uh, uh, they're ready to accept our leadership and glad to accept our leadership, but not dictation. You know, people, uh, these people that we're dealing with have fought for their independence and died for it, and they're not going to sell their independence. Mr. Harriman, may I interrupt to ask you what you think of this administration's approach to a bipartisan foreign policy? Are you satisfied with it? No, there have been no attempt until this last... Uh, calling in by the president of the Democratic leaders to tell them what the uh, State of the Union speech was going to say about foreign policy and military. Now, that's not consultation. I, uh, there hasn't been consultation with the Democrats. There's been support the, by the Democrats of uh, President Eisenhower's foreign policies, but uh, in the days when we had bipartisanship, there was real consultation with the Republic, by the administration, with the Republican leaders before decisions were, were taken. And that's the only way to get real bipartisanship. 
give the opposition a chance to uh, have their views considered before decisions are, as to policy are reached. We can see the days of Vandenberg when he was, he was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee of the Senate, uh, the administration, President Truman and uh, the Secretary of State and myself on, on different occasions consulted with him and his uh, colleagues uh, uh, before decisions were reached and his advice was, was taken in many cases uh, and uh, there, there could be a concerning of policies and objectives and our security is so important that I think we ought to get back to that atmosphere. Well, Mr. Harriman, we all like to look ahead at this time of the year. So may I ask you as a final question, what you think our foreign policy should be towards our allies? Well, I, as I said, I think we've, we should continue to what we have been attempting to do in the last several years, but I think we should do it with somewhat more vigor. I think we've got to maintain, unfortunately, a military establishment uh, that can protect ourselves and give uh, an impetus to our friends and allies to make the effort which they can make to do their share. But when we relax, why, they will relax, and therefore I do regret this cut in our military expenditures. I also believe that we should give leadership and recognize that when there are now there are less tensions, uh, there's less fear in the world, it requires a greater skillful leadership on our part uh, to keep the Grand Co Coalition together, to give unity among our allies. And I believe, of course, that the free world stands together. There can be no doubt as to the outcome of this uh, struggle against the evil forces of the Kremlin. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Collingwood and I. We had a great deal of pleasure in having you here tonight, Mr. Harriman. I enjoyed very much being with you. The opinions you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry LeSeur and Charles Collingwood. Our distinguished guest was Averill Harriman, formerly Ambassador to Russia and Secretary of Commerce. Since the days of its infancy, the record flights of the airplane have been timed almost exclusively by Longines the first watch of aviation, and official watch for the National Aeronautic Association. And now, Longines salutes a new record maker and a new record. Colonel Willard W. Milliken, the National Guard officer who flew an F-86 Sabre jet from Los Angeles to New York in four hours, eight minutes, and five seconds, breaking the old record established in 1946 by some five minutes, which record was also Longine time. The service of Longines watches in aviation, in sports timing, in scientific work, continuously adds luster to the reputation for greater accuracy of all Longines watches. Any Longines watch shown here is not only beautiful to look upon, but will give in full measure the greater accuracy for which Longines watches are world-renowned. For in truth, Longines is the world's most honored watch, the only watch in history to win 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals, and so many honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. Yet, a Longines watch is not excessively expensive, for you may buy and own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches.